Bitcoin has been a, having a bumpy last few days. Today, it's up and back above 70,000. But as you can see last week, Bitcoin was trading much lower, sliding as low as 60,000 at one point. In stark contrast, while Bitcoin is up, Bitcoin ETFs hit a record in outflows. Last week, the 10 Bitcoin ETFs saw $888 million in total outflows. That's about 94% of total crypto fund flows, according to Bloomberg. Where's the disconnect? Let's bring in CNBC's Mackenzie Segalos. Why are we seeing Bitcoin rise and everybody ditching ETFs? So this is definitely a grayscale problem. We've seen these record outflows in the last two weeks in GBTC, and a lot of that had to do with the bankruptcy proceedings of Genesis. As part of that, both Genesis and Gemini liquidated about $2.9 billion worth of uh, their GBTC stake. Part of that's just shoring up the cash to pay back creditors. But even before that, Contessa, we just saw Grayscale really struggle with flows because their fees are so much higher. We're talking 1.5% versus 0.3%. That's the next biggest fee here. Now, collectively speaking, we are still looking at $52 billion of assets under management across all the funds. So it, it's still a promising space, but Grayscale has been struggling. Hi. You intersect AI and the power of inf information don't have and to go data. To Stanford. We don't want to go to Stanford with AI. AI is about not going to Stanford. Correct. Pop AI, shop. well, That's AI coding is in English now. It's right. not some they, code. They, people should realize we're, that we're, we're, we're going to be democratizing yes. information, and that's going to empower more people to have more opportunity. But more importantly, we're going to need huge sums of money to invest in these data centers. Yes, we do. And and if we're going to be the leader, if we're going to be the leader, and I, I must say, when I talk to every other country, every other country wants to be a leader in, in AI, and they're going to be investing in this and building data centers, and every data center people are going to want are going to be a, uh, with with uh, decarbonized technology, right. wind or solar, and so we're, we're, we're seeing this uh, live. Well, some breaking news right now on some major credit card companies and a long-running legal saga. Kate Rooney joins us with more. Hi, Kate. Hi, Becky. Good morning. So Visa and MasterCard are settling a class action lawsuit that's been going on for decades now, two decades now. The companies have agreed to lower the rates they charge merchants, that's known as interchange fees, and are agreeing not to raise those rates for at least five years. Interchange, as some context here, is the fee retailers pay when somebody swipes a debit card or a credit card. At stores, it's set by the card companies. They're also saying that they're going to give businesses a bit more flexibility when it comes to the terms, including the ability to steer customers to preferred payment methods, and they'll allow surcharging as well. The plaintiff's attorney saying in a statement that this will bring $30 billion or so of savings on fees to merchants. They also say the settlement is among the largest in U.S. antitrust history. Visa, in its statement, saying that these were, quote, meaningful concessions that address true pain points small businesses have identified, while MasterCard, for its part, says this agreement brings a closure to a longstanding dispute by delivering substantial certainty and value to business owners. The settlement resolves claims going back to 2005, guys, when a group of retailers filed a class action lawsuit claiming, among other things, that Visa and MasterCard's fees and network rules violate U.S. antitrust laws. The defendants in the case include Visa, MasterCard, and a number of other U.S. financial institutions. The settlement is still subject to court approval. Back over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, as you mentioned, this is a long-running saga. We were just looking at the stock prices. Maybe we can bring that back up again, because that shows you right now the street's instant reaction, at least, to what happens. As Kate mentioned, this is still going to be subject to a U.S. court signing mm. off on it. Uh, but both those stocks up by about eight-tenths of a percent this morning um, maybe tells you a little bit about what the market is thinking. But again, this is knee-jerk reaction, and we need to hear more on it. Welcome, Welcome to the Crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you join the patrons. If you're not a part of the patrons, make sure you're in the cash out. And we had Bitcoin very volatile, up 10,000, down 5,000, back up 5,000, down about three to 5,000, and then back up about 4,000. And we know when you're making big moves like that, it's big money. It's the hedge fund guys. Remember, they make money whether it's going up or down. And then we have Larry Fink in the house. Larry Fink speaking about AI and data centers. And why is he speaking about AI and data centers? It's all for the fourth industrial revolution. They want the robots, algorithms, and drones to take the economy over, pay each other with crypto, and the sheep to go inside the metaverse. 
We know how much energy these data centers take. It's just not going to go off clean energy. We know better than that. Now we have Visa and MasterCard coming to a settlement due to swipe fees. Why is this, guys? Because now we're moving over to the digital economy. Real-time settlement. And we know Visa and MasterCard have been funding crypto from the beginning. Tokenization is going to make them a lot of money. Remember, only the NWO banks are going to be left standing. And then we had Larry Fink speak about retirement. And guys, we know retirement pensions are going to be out the window because they're going to be bringing in universal basic income. Because basically, majority of people are not going to be working anyway in order to save up retirement anyway. And that's the reason why if you want to make it in a fourth industrial revolution, get to understanding the technology. Jerome Powell clearly states a lot of people are going to be left behind. Remember, my people perish from the lack of knowledge because they rejected, guys. Not because not there, because they rejected. We have all the knowledge right at our fingertips, but we stay distracted on things that don't matter. Now, if you look at the stock market, the only reason why the stock market is pumping is because all the money is going through a few stocks. And then on top of it, you have those same stocks doing billions and billions of dollars worth of buybacks, not hiring new employees, not making the company better, just making the monopoly stronger and handing money over to the shareholders and majority of the shareholders are the people who already own the company or inside the company. I know, guys, you can't make this stuff up. And then we had another distraction comment. The bridge is down. And, guys, you know I can't say what I want to say. But don't forget, guys, this is Dixie Line. There's a lot of symbolism around this, guys. And we know when it comes to supply chain, we're in a fragmented world. So you're talking about automobiles, tourists the actual port, and not to mention we saw three sparks at the top of it. Not Definitely not going to get into that. And it just happened to hit perfect with no damage. Yes, guys, you can't make this stuff up. But I'm definitely not going to go down that rabbit hole. But I told you this year, next year, we in for a whole bunch of distractions, and they only need that one crisis because you can do things you thought you'd never be able to do. Guys, get into the lab because you do not want to be caught on the wrong side of history. And remember the crypto teacher told you. Because he knows when it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. But I emphasize it in this letter. And, you know, all my letters have been based on some long-term issues. And let me be really truthful about my letters. My letters are a reflection of my conversation with clients. So it is... And, and so over the past year, I heard more and more conversation about retirement, the retirement crisis from many parts of the world, from middle class developing countries to developed countries. Um, the acute problem here in the United, United States is that we have still 57 million Americans who, who don't have any savings or any retirement plan. Social Security is a fantastic foundation for retirement. But if that's all you have when you retire... You're, you're going to be living in, in, a, in, in poverty, below the poverty line, because it just is not, it's supplemental, but it's not meant to be the totality of what you have in a retirement. And the whole concept of we're aging, we're, you know, we're all living longer. And I think one of the big narratives I've had to reflect in 2023 was the miracles of medicine. When we talk about the drugs like Ozempec and all the different uh, weight loss drugs, how that is extending life. It's, it's conquering kidney disease and liver disease and heart disease and joint disease. And, and, and then there are new medicines now for, for dementia that extends life. So if you, you think about the miracles of technology and how it transforms our lives and extends our life, there is not a dialogue in America or most places about can we afford that longevity. And our entire retirement system was based on statistics that were created 50 years ago, whereby most Americans retired between 60 and 62 then, but most Americans then passed away at uh, 67. And today, statistically, uh, a couple uh, 60 years old in good health, one of them is going to live over 90. And so... The other question is, should we reevaluate how we work and how long we work? Because 
we all need purpose in life. And in most play, most people get find purpose, obviously, maybe with their grandchildren, their children, their their community. Many people find purpose in their in their jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, the thought of retiring at 60 with 30 more years or a 30 year, li year life mm -hmm. in front of you, these we need to have a dialogue. We need to have a conversation. And, you know, I'm an optimist. Yeah. I am very optimistic about the long term vitality of, right. of, of our markets. I'm bullish on capitalism. Right. The reason why I'm bullish is that when I read the newspapers every morning and listen to Bloomberg and other news organizations, it's full of scary things. We talk about the problems. Yeah. We talk about all the problems in life. But we solve problems through conversation. Right. And the one area where we have no conversation is, is the affordability of retirement and the whole concept of retirement. And we need to start a global and most importantly, a national dialogue. For the year, if we broaden out, the S&P 500 up about 10%, and those gains may be set to continue because my next guest says, as I said at the top, we're in a debt-fueled buyback-driven market, and that will fuel the bull market for years to come. But it will also contribute to some scary corrections. Partially collapsed after it was struck by a large container ship. Eamon Jevers is there with the latest. Good morning, Eamon. And good morning, Joe. An absolutely surreal scene here at the Port of Baltimore this morning. I can tell you I was coming into the area uh, just after sunrise this morning, and this bridge is visible normally for miles around, and just about two miles away, you can see the collapsed bridge. You can see the two points of the traffic on either side where the highway had gone up to the bridge, and this enormous gap in the middle of the bridge visible in the water below uh, where the highway would have been from, uh, as I say, miles around. Uh, this is the port of Baltimore, Joe. It's a major East, Cub, East Coast hub of commerce and traffic. It is the largest port for automobiles. More than 800,000 automobiles uh, came into this port uh, in 2023. That was the 13th year that this has been the leading port for automobiles on the East Coast of the United States. So an enormous, enormous facility. That just over to my left here as we're coming in, acres and acres of uh, new cars arriving. So you can imagine the scale of the interruption to commerce that will take place here. In addition, of course, to the very human tragedy that happened uh, here this morning. This is still, authorities say, an active search and rescue scene, uh, but we are now uh, some six hours uh, after the incident itself. So authorities will be giving more information at 9.30 a.m., uh, and we'll get the latest from them in terms of what they think uh, they're looking at here in terms of the, the human toll today. Uh, obviously, a tragedy for the city of Baltimore, Joe. This is the highway that runs over the Francis Scott Key Bridge behind me is 695. That's a major regional artery. So in terms of traffic uh, in and out and in the surrounding area of Baltimore, uh, that's going to be massively impacted. Uh, I-95 itself, it will, will not necessarily be, but the tunnels uh, in Baltimore will be impacted as well. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, traffic coming into the port will be impacted for some unknown period of time, Joe. The, the bridge span that is down in the water here just behind me bottlenecks the port uh, itself. So any traffic coming into the port of Baltimore will be interrupted by this, including uh, the cruise lines, Carnival and the other cruise lines uh, sail out of this port as well. So uh, impacts uh, across the board in terms of commerce, tourism, regional traffic, and of course, the human tragedy uh, that we may be dealing with here this morning, Joe, as authorities still try to get their arms around exactly uh, how many are missing and how many are unaccounted for. Back over to you. Going to a different economy, and we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers in Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box.
uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to eight percent of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American. You know, uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it is it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told as members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system is kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Very much a traditionalist. I like staying with the dollar. You know that from when I was there. It's make, mm -hmm. make the dollar the choice. I hate when countries go off the dollar. I would not allow countries to go off the dollar because when we lose that standard, that will be like uh, losing a revolutionary war. That will be, that will be a hit to our country, just like losing a war. And we can't let that happen. And too many countries now are fighting to get off the dollar. And crypto teacher and the new world order book plus the three kids books is time to reeducate. Also, new to cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming. While everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the see the biotech stocks. And while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks and you have a wonderful day. most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate not just me, 
but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim face the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim face New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim goes to China. It's mandatory to get part one, part two, and part three of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.